Thank you. <clears throat> Title, obviously, Conducting Responsible and Ethical Archaeological Research on Easter Island, also known as Rapa Nui. Uh, building diachronic and lasting relationships with the local Rapa Nui community. Uh, I would like to start out by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, both past and present, uh, especially the, the contemporary custodians of the land. Uh, I especially like to thank the Illini, uh, the Miami, and later Fox, Ho-Chunk, Potawatomi, and Sauk Nations, uh, who this is their lands, and I am so happy that you came before us. Uh, more thanks. Uh, this was an outstanding conference. Uh, I've been to many throughout the world, and I found this well organized, and it was only a five-minute drive from my house. So that's a real benefit for me. Uh, all the, uh, the sponsors, uh, any, everyone who played a role uh, to make this happen, who presented, I'm really appreciative to, to meet everyone. And accolades to Jared, definitely Lindsay. I know more people contributed, but these two really helped uh, to get me in this position and to give this chat. So thank you very much to them. Uh, I won't read this, <laughs> but I have so many people to thank over 17 years of research on Easter Island. Um, you know, no one is an island, literally. Uh, you are stronger to your connections. The more connections that you can make, uh, the, the better you're going to see this world. And all these individuals have helped me see this world a little bit better. So uh, thank you very much. You might be in there, maybe not, I don't know. Um, when I say Easter Island, most people think about aliens. Uh, I get questions all the time like, so Dale, um, where's the crash site? Uh, crash site? Uh, yeah, the alien crash site. You know, the guys who crash landed and made the statues. And I say, well, that's another chat in another room, probably on another History Channel show that I'm not part of. Um, and we see this misinterpretation of the Easter Islanders for many years. Um, individuals that use small bits of data to make grand narratives, right? Uh, even a, a study just came out about a week ago about an astrobiologist who simulated that aliens around the world would, would die, therefore were going to die, because he used Easter Island as a case study, right? Uh, we've got other things, talking a little bit about Tor Heyerdahl, um, you know, a very important Norwegian individual who crossed the ocean believing that the Rapa Nui people came from South America, which we know true today that that's not true, right? Uh, you might have seen the movie um, Mars Attacks, where they bowling ball down and kill all the Moai, right? So there's some of these things in the image. The one that, the one that really uh, upsets me is the idea of dum dum want gum gum, right? If you ever see that movie, Night at the Museum, for the Rapa Nui people, that's a little disrespectful, right? So we've got to always keep in mind what's funny and, and what's disrespectful. And I think we're crossing some lines there. Um, I like the one up there, I was trapped by the things on Easter Island. Yeah, I've been trapped there for 17 years, and I, I don't think I'm leaving sometime soon. It's, as I said, it's one of the most magical places in the world. Um, one individual near, named Jared Diamond we'll talk a little bit about today, uh, he really had this idea that Easter Islanders collapsed, that they died, that they're extinct. I got a couple questions here. So how many people live on Easter Island? Well, a lot, almost 7,000. They're a living culture. So if there's one thing that you take away from this chat today, one thing, the Easter Island people are strong, they're vibrant, they're, they're, they're an amazing group of people to be around, and I'm, I'm happy to be able to do a lot of research with them. The latest census shows that we're at about, uh, almost, as I said, 7,000, uh, and uh, all of these people are my friends and family, uh, and I love one of them especially. But I think some of this mystery comes from its, its isolation, uh, and not... And not um, and people fabricating stories about the past. Um, basically, if we go from our conference almost 5,000 miles to the middle of the Pacific, we'll find Easter Island. Uh, we have Chile, who annexed it in 1888 and became its colonial owner till today. But uh, the cultural connection is much more into Polynesia. Uh, and these are very proud Polynesian people. So that's one group we'll be talking about today, our, our proud Polynesians. And how do you integrate um, research? How do you have integrity? when you deal with cultures that aren't your own. That's, that's a really important thing, and I, I know some of the chats during this chat, uh, during our conference have talked about that. Now, Rapa Nui, though, is the end product of basically 65,000 years of history in the Pacific, of human history, okay? Um, at the University of Queensland, where I'm finishing my work, uh, a site was found just last year that dated back to 65,000 years that humans had made the push early Pleistocene people into Australia. So we know we have groups already 65,000. 
Then maybe around three to 4,000 years ago, a group in Taiwan called Lapita, they pushed their way through into the Pacific, further colonizing. But then it'd be the Polynesians, maybe 2,000 years ago, that make the push and colonize the famous triangle of New Zealand on the bottom, or Aotearoa, the long white cloud, Hawaii, which we all know in the news frequently from the volcano or the eruptions, and then Easter Island on the other side. French Polynesia, Tahiti, uh, is seen sort of as the uh, headway for the colonization of the Pacific of, of Polynesia. So if you can imagine, Tahiti's like an octopus. It's the head of the octopus, and all of the little islands are are the tentacles. So Tahiti is going to be our, our head point. Uh, we do know that then from Rapa Nui, perhaps, they went to the mainland. They kept going. There they found the sweet potato, they introduced the chicken, and came back and really colonized the entire Pacific. So it's a really true, a, a true adventure story. When we look at Polynesians, there's this maohi motif. I've written a little bit about this. Uh, and it's the idea that uh, you can see similarities on all these islands that you go to. Things like biology and DNA, um, linguistics, how they organize themselves through sociopolitical, economic, and ideological ways, their material culture, their artifacts, their tattoo, which if I didn't have all my clothes on, I would show you. Uh, song, dance, line boards, sort of like cats in the cradle that they play, um, subsistence, how they cooked, how they farmed, how they uh, had chickens and dogs and pigs. Um, their monumental architecture and statues, right? And finally, navigational knowledge and technologies like the double-hauled canoe. Most, you would find a similarity. You would find uh, a lot of homogeneity in any island you go to about these topics. So this is a very important, and, and a lot of work has been done before me. I'm very interested in traditional navigation. Uh, in fact, when NASA was trying to go uh, to explore, they talked to Polynesian navigators. Because the hypothesis is, if our rocket ships are going to go in the space in the future, these were the rocket ships 2,000 years ago. They went island to island, and one day we'll go planet to planet. Right? So maybe these Polynesians who are in the waters for 30, 40, 60 days, maybe we can learn some from them. Keys of the future are in the past, but you've got to look for them. Have you seen the movie Moana? Yay. Yay. No? OK. I'll find the way. Well, there are some issues about cultural appropriation in the movie and, and some wrong identities about how we see the Pacific people. But one thing they did very well is their idea of these navigators pushing through and colonizing uh, the oceans ahead of them and coming back. Right? This is a, a parent sort of child relationship. But on Rapa Nui, what's interesting is that once they got there, they probably were the only ones to get there. Some of our evidence suggests that there was probably one main colonization in, and that's it. And that's pretty cool for humanity because that means they have little influence coming from the outside. So we can see how a culture evolves, changes, adapts through time. Okay? Uh, most likely, the Rapa Nui people came in a double hull canoe like this, full of people, artifacts, plants, animals, women, warriors, chiefs, priests, the whole. This is, this is the, the Polynesian motif ready to go. It's, it's going to be the seed that'll go to all these islands and be planted, right? Um, the oral tradition tells us of a chief called Hotumatua who came to the island and settled it. Maybe him with, with, with some, some specialists, maybe with his wife or sister, and they came to Rapa Nui. Um, now, the first chief, you know, it, it, he, was, he is the primogenitor. This individual started the culture. He brought the culture on, on, onto the island. And we've got a pretty good idea when they get there through genealogies, genealogy, genealogical, and carbon-14 dating, which only dates things that were living at one time. Can't use carbon-14 on stones, only on things that were alive. This is Rito Rocco Tuki Valentino. He was the last chief of the island who just passed. So the Rapa Nui people are still trying to keep their connections to the ancestors. And when I look at a picture of what Cook saw, uh, well, this is actually Hodge's drawing, but during Cook's visit, uh, Hodge's was his sort of artist. Um, I, don't see, I don't see that much difference, right? The, 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 there's a continuation here. Um, and uh, that date that we have, like I said to a little bit earlier, someone asked me, about 11 to 1200 AD. So this is almost a millennium culture, OK? This is what he got to. This is what Hotumatua came to, the island that we call Easter Island, because on um, 
On Easter Day, 1722, a Dutch uh, navigator named Jacob Rochgreen showed up. It was Easter. He said, hey, it's Easter. Hey, that's an island. Hey, that's Easter Island. <laughs> Pretty simple. Islanders sometimes call it Rapa Nui, which can mean the big paddle. Um, there's another island called Rapa in the Australia archipelago, so there may be some connection. Uh, but most people call it Te Pinto Te Henua, which means the belly button of the world. And this is a very sacred part, the belly button. This is where your mana comes from, your energy. So for your mother and to you, that, that lifeline brings the mana into you. So therefore, they're very taboo. Can't be touching around with someone's belly button or their head. Very sacred. But the island is, we'll see, very beautiful, triangular shape, basically the size of Washington, D.C. Just a little parallel. So it's much bigger than people think. Main town right here is called Hangaroa, where everyone lives today, which means the Long Bay. 6,600 people living there. Um, but really, it, it is a place of isolation. The only, if you're on the island, you go to the highest point right here in Terivaca, uh, the only land you can see is the moon. You see nothing else but ocean for 365 degrees when you turn around. And I thought that being isolated would be scary. But in the isolation, I found myself. Right? It's not always a bad thing to have adversaries. It's not always a bad thing to have conflict. Um, but as the chief was making his rounds, he came into two of the beaches on island. On the island. One's called Hangarao or Anakena. The other one's Ovaje. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Ovaje later. But this is a beautiful place. This is the beach of the king. And as we move in a little bit deeper, this is the platforms that they made for themselves. So we have the Moai. Can we say that? Moai. Moai. Oh, very good. Ahu for the platform. And then Pukau for the hat. Perfect. You learned three Polynesian words. So this place of the chief and the eye is watching us, this is a very sacred place. Me and Ralph were talking about sacred places that he's been to as well. How do you as a foreigner, as an outsider, go and hang out and, and want to do excavations on these places? How do you cross that, that gap? How do, you, how do you go from your position and try to uh, collaborate and show individuals why you want to do your work. Um, what Hotumatua did is, with his six sons, he divided the land uh, from different points all throughout. And these became mata, or clans. And the lands inside become mata kainga, which is clan land. Pretty simple. Um, all of these, till today, most people, when you ask them what clan do you come from, they can slowly trace a little bit back. They're not like the Maori who can sit for two hours and recite their Faka Papa, which is their genealogy. That's a quite an impressive sight. But they still have some connections in these individuals. The Miruariki were the most important one. These are the elite individuals. And then in each one of these clans, there's a higher individual called a Tanata Honui, who's sort of a big man. He'd be in charge. He'd be the secondary chief. Um, when some ethnographic work came in there, we can see it went from six sons and six lands to ten clans. And then a recent, this recent study uh, showed there were 18 till today. So it shows that humanity changes. Things evolve, things get larger, things get smaller. But this, will, this social political map is sort of important uh, to understand that you've got two main confederations then. The Kotu'u Aro, Kote Motoiti, which is the, the bottom clan, the lower class clans of the confederations, and the Kotu Aro Kote Matanui, which is the bigger clans up top, okay? I just quickly want to show you when they got there, it was a paradise. There was probably some um, 16 to 20 million palm trees on the island. They, they were, we've documented 48 plants. We've seen 21 types of trees. How do you, well, Dale, how do you figure that out? Well, honestly, we, we use um, analogy. This is in Chile. These are probably what some of the palm trees would look like. Um, we can look at root molds, that these are what the roots on the bottom. When you dig in the ground, you find root molds that are still preserved. Um, really cool, we see all of these um, endocarps, which are the seeds that fall uh, and plant. Notice all the holes, because the rats ate them. And that plays into some of the ecology. Uh, we can use uh, core samples that we use a lot to date and get carbon-14. Obviously, the deeper you go, the older in time you're at, right? Um, we also can use SEM, sort of scanning electron microscope, to see pollen of the palm that no longer exists on the island. So yes, multiple trees were cut down. 
the, t the narrative is they cut down all the trees to move the statues, or did they? Bird population. This was an, an amazing place for the diversity of birds. It was a launching place for the migration throughout the Pacific. Um, we see about 31 birds in the past, but only six exist till today because they use them as a resource. Even the petroglyph record, these are petroglyphs found throughout the site, document a diversity of birds. And that probably was a great thing for them. They probably got there and just ate them till they were gone. Because we know the pig and the dog doesn't become important on Easter Island. Maybe it fell overboard. Maybe they ate it on the ship. But once they saw all these birds and the nests and the eggs, they were like, well, I care for pigs. Let's focus on the birds. But slowly but surely, they died. And then more uh, modern introductions have, have come. So it, it is a bio, it, it's very biodiverse in the land of birds. Also sea animals. These are some artifacts from the Field Museum in Chicago that I've worked with. Here are some seal bones, whale, whale seal. Again, petroglyph record on this side speaks of tons of different type of animals that they were hunting, eating. But some of the elite would have higher calls. The elite we know are eating things like dolphins, whales, um, turtles, right? These are upper class food sources because we don't find them outside the king's area because the king is controlling this resource. This is what he's using. Fish, now if you went to Fiji or Tahiti and you went snorkeling, you'd see maybe 900, 1,000 fish. Very biodiverse. In Rapa Nui, it's not that diverse in the ocean. Only 167 because we're a little farther south. We're a little far, we're, we're, we're south of the tropics, therefore we don't have um, a reef. There's no extended reef, so we don't have a lot of reef species. But of that number, almost 25% are endemic and exist nowhere else in the world. So it's a very important place if you're interested in a sort of evolution uh, and understanding homogeneity versus heterogeneity. Coral as well. We have not huge coral heads. We have smaller heads uh, that we look at and that they're there, along with uh, a biodiversity of mollusks. But the reason why we don't have as many as you would see is because the water's colder, no protective reef. Therefore, we don't have all the elements that you need, uh, like polyps, to make larger coral or to have larger shells like you do all throughout Tahiti. But the most important thing for me is the rocks. I love rocks. I love how rocks become artifacts. I love the whole process. And on Rapa Nui, we have a lot of rocks. These are all volcanic flows that have been documented that then we do some of our analysis to understand what elements are inside these flows. And then can we identify them individually compared to other places? Um, the island formed maybe 800,000 years ago. There was about 100 volcanic events, uh, uh, events all throughout. And these events created a diversity of rock types. And it really made it a Neolithic paradise. Neolithic only means after uh, the domestication of crops and animals. They never had metallurgy. They didn't have beast of burden but they did have a lot of rocks to fulfill their materialism. And that definitely included the famous Moai statues. About a thousand of them throughout the island, including inside the quarry still till today, to all the platforms around the island, the Ahu. Um, some of them are more famous. Some of them were named. They all had names in the past, but we only give them numbers now. We've lost a little of that oral tradition, but we know some of them till today. Uh, Tongariki, as we'll talk a little bit about, pretty dominant area pretty dominant area. At one time, 30 statues were involved. A tsunami came in there in 1960 and threw them all away. Japanese company, a Chilean company, and a Polish team came in and restored it, making it the largest monument in the Pacific. But they also did other things with stone. Um, petroglyphs, as we were talking about, on flat papa stones. They're flat stones. Uh, houses in Orongo. These are their ovens called umu because they cooked in the ground. They're Polynesians. Um, we have gardens. This is called a manavai, where they would rock a uh, 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 dig and rock a structure and put inside banana, sweet potato, taro, marijuana. <laughs> One stop shopping, you know. Uh, chicken houses. This is through a, a 3D scan of a chicken house. Because pigs and dogs don't make it, chicken becomes very important. And it becomes something you want to protect. Water collectors called tajetas. Uh, this stone's a, a ceremonial stone called tipito tehenua. Uh, and, and, and it's amazing, too, that even, even their artifacts are of different materials. Their fish hooks, their adzes to make their canoes and knives, and these are scrapers so I can sharpen my fish hook. Net weights, and then tokies, or adzes, 
which were used for anything to carve the statues, to carving little figures. So in this first bit, I know I took a little more time. I wanted to flesh it out to give you a little bit of a background. Um, but what I can conclude in this first thing is that prehistoric Rapa Nui was sociopolitically, economically, and ideologically controlled by the elite Rapa Nui, including chiefs, priests, and experts. I'm a political economist. I like using some of Marx's ideas in archaeology. It fits. It works. It gives us a theory of something used in archaeology quite frequently to give us frameworks to go from the known to the unknown. Uh, and this is one thing that we, we, we very much like to uh, idea. So here we've got a chief, perhaps, uh, over, you've got, you got a master here, a Maori. He's, his name is Tanata Maori Anga Moai. Uh, he's the one, he's the Moai master. Workers, someone overseeing blessing. And then here we have from a video game. <laughs> a little screenshot from a video game of a Rapa Nui chief. Um, but this is where I come in the story. Um, so I graduated from the University of Manitoba in 2002. But in one of my classes with one of my most influential professors who taught me a lot about integrity and in research, Dr. John Lux Chilkivik, this little French man who spoke five or six languages, made us read an article about Jared Diamond uh, called Easter's End. And it became this idea that Easter uh, is a uh, uh, cause celebre for destruction, human overconsumption. That's what we are as human beings. We're, we're made to eat and make babies and destroy the land. And he really got famous in his 2005 publication about uh, collapse. He's an orphanologist. He's not an archeologist. He's a synthesizer. He was on the island for maybe a couple months. I've been there for 17 years and I still don't know what the hell's going on. So there is something about being your research integrity. How long are you on the ground? How long do you have your feet on the ground for? Very important. So from there, I started my travels and started my life. I graduated from Wheaton Warrenville South High School, which is literally down the road. Um, I then was fortunate to be picked up in 2001 to go onto a field school with some individuals here in this group are some of the most important archaeologists in the Pacific at this moment. You've got the individual, the, the cultural director of resources, Mara Mulrooney. You have an individual, Owen, who, works, who worked for JPAC which was in charge of bringing fallen vets home. They'd go to excavate, bring vets home. Um, especially in the Pacific, where we had a, our theater operations during World War II. Um, from there, I've lived on the island multiple times. In 2003, I lived there two years when my son was first born, Hiranimo, with my ex-wife at the time. Uh, and that's where I really got into the culture, started to learn the language, started to be taught by the elders. That was really important. Um, I guided, I taught, I did research, I even tour guided. I learned how to speak in front of people. And that's an important uh, uh, ability that we need to do more. So these conferences are important. Uh, 2008, I was finishing my, my master's. We were there for Tapati for two years, which is a two week festival. If you're ever gonna go there, go there in February, the first two weeks. Parte. <laughs> it, it's a great, but it's a cultural time. And what they do is they represent and they, they sort of conduct some 50 events, traditional events. And the hypothesis, there's two ladies that are coming to become the queen or king of the island. And every one of the events has a point total. Every candidate that represents one of the two candidates, and whoever wins gives the points to that individual. At the end of the, at the, end of the competition, there's a big celebration, there's a big parade, everyone dresses up, and you really, maybe for two weeks, feel what it's like to be Rapa Nui. Um, went back 2011 for some other teaching and research, and then from 2014 to 8, that's where I've been work living back and forth. Um, luckily, COD, thank you for your online classes that I can teach online. Um, I really appreciate that. Uh, and I, going back, I'm leaving this time in one month. I'll be in Chile to see my son, and then I spend another month there. And then in November, we go back for our big conference, and I'm really hoping that COD may help me out with that. So let's go Global Initiative Grant. So, uh, you know, I, it's this me, 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 I get it. But the, the whole point is just the timeline. I've put my time in. I've put my feet on the ground. I've built integrity through rapport. My, my first speaking point here is Rapa Nui rapport is built through building integrity for research. You really have to know who you're talking to. You have to put your feet on the ground. You've got you've to be there. And, I, and I've done it in multiple ways. 
whether it be and I'll highlight some of those places from teaching to guiding to giving back. On any of all these pictures right here, I didn't make any money. But this is the best, this is the most valuable thing to me, building that rapport. So, um, if I may, this is sort of the more technical part. I have three ways that I've tried to build rapport and diachronic relationships on Easter Island. One is through environmental activism, one is through educational outreach, and the last one is through research, publication, and presentation. Um, last year, I did something on YouTube with uh, the Strategic Hotbox in Las Vegas. If you're interested in more of these things, you can watch me for another hour if you care. <laughs> but this is online. Just, ty just type in Strategic Hotbox Dale Simpson. It'll drop up. You can listen to me and if you want. So environmental activism. Let's start with this. This is a, a picture of the island. Uh, the red areas that I want you to focus on and the big ones where we have huge amount of erosion. It's one of the big problems. When all the trees disappeared, cut down, whatever happened to them, it left a big void. They rebuilt some oh, eucalyptus stands in some area, especially to uh, stop the erosion. And in this area right here in Poike, um, you can see here's the trees that have been planted in the last 20 years. So we're trying to get it back. But these have been divided to, to replant. And that was one of the first things I was interested in doing, getting into the community, getting my knees on the ground, hanging out with little kids, getting made fun, really getting made fun of, of little kids by how funny I look. <laughs> right? But we, we end up planting a huge amount of trees, and every year they keep planting and keep planting. Does that show signs of collapse? But one bigger problem that I've been focused on since 2013 is AMD, anthropogenic marine debris. We all know about the plastic pollution in this world that's happening right now. Um, these are just a highlight of photos of things that, anything that has fish hooks still stuck in the face, to nets, to microplastics in the stomach, to whole islands of garbage, to fish, well, you get it. You get it. But the microplastics, the things we can't see, are another big issue. And microfibers, every time you wash your clothes, your fleece, these things enter the water. They come in the ocean, and we're finding them. We're finding microbeads that are used. If you're using scrub that has microbeads, stop using them now. That stuff doesn't break down, enters the waterway, goes in the water. Um, these pellets, these are the, basically the matrix that make all plastic products start as pellets. And sometimes boats go from one end of the Pacific to the other, and they crash over. And all these pellets enter the, the water stream. The fish end up eating them. We eat the fish. Therefore, we're eating plastic on our island. Maybe not that big of a deal for us here because I can go to Whole Fool and be all cool. But where these people live and, de and, and depend on, they're being attacked. So Mama Pidu here, who's one of my idols, um, she works in a lot of activities, including bringing back Rapa Nui remains from museums to the island, to looking for artifacts abroad to bring them back home. But she's been interested for years in cleaning up her island. This is a typical beachfront after a high tide coming all over. And it was being done in a very great way, but no one was documenting it. So we started in 2014, all the way to 2017, last year. Uh, this, publica this publication is impressed at the moment. I wish I had some, some better uh, slides for you on this, but um, we got after it. We, we started to find a methodology. So I use archeological techniques to collect garbage. That's what I already do. But this case, we were interested in documenting how much weight per area do you have of garbage in each area so we know where to go and therefore clean up a little bit better. So we, we did some surveys all throughout, as you, as you can see, the south coast, north coast a few times because this area is very heavy hit and this is where the beaches and all the tourism goes and then next to the town. Granted, we have a lot more to do, but this is preliminary results. So this is what you got to do. You got to get into it. We use the sieve to separate the microplastic from the sand. We get kids involved, most important part. Teach them now the problem that they're dealing with. Um, we have uh, groups that we bring together, and, and people get into it. Does this show collapse? Um, this is after a big uh, uh, tide came in. You can actually see the wave that brought the microplastics in, if you look very carefully. So using that sieve that you see in the middle, in 20 minutes, we cleaned one liter bag of microplastics. I also excavated a small little pit 50 centimeters deep. And what I found out is that these microplastics attach themselves to rocks. 
they get embedded in the sand and they stay there. So that must mean there are layers upon layers upon layers of microplastics that we're trying to deal with. We also deal with a lot of nets and ropes and evidence of industrial fishing. Um, if you're interested, you can look up Rapa Nui Magic Visual or look up Race for Water, two projects that I'm a part of where we're trying to really clean the island up, but we're, we're, we're facing a losing battle. There's so much coming to this island, day and eight, but we're still fighting. We're not collapsing. This is what we get the majority of time. This is from Australia. This is from New Zealand. This is from New Zealand. This is from China. These are nets, industrial nets, that most likely were cut and set off. Uh, and this is a Koro, an older man, a gentleman, who's taking all of these buoys that we get thousands and thousands of these that come to the island. So when we did our first study, what we, we collected in total, we had about 360 people in those seven things. In total, we collected almost 4,000 kil uh, kilograms of trash, times that by 2.2, to get us in pounds, sorry, yeah, by 2.2 to get us pounds, now we're looking at 10,000 pounds of garbage and AMD that we're cleaning up. Notice this staggering amount, cigarette filter count, 9,000. Yeah, it's a real deal. So if you smoke, don't be a butthead. Find the place it needs to go. But these are what we're dealing with. There's, there's more data here. Like I said, this is one that's in press, so I, I'm, I'm not going to go that deep into it. I just wanted to highlight some of the, the chart toppers. So what did we figure out? Well, we know that there are five gyres in the world, and the Pacific is one of them. Rapa Nui is right there on the edge of it. So as all these gyres start making their movement, it starts swirling around, swirling. You go in the middle there, people have found 80,000 parts per meter squared. But we're on the edge, so what we're doing is we're catching some of this, whether it be the microplastic, whether it be the larger AMD, all these things are coming to us. But we realize also that it's the illegal fishermen. This is a, a, a tuna fish and swordfish forecast about where all the good places are going to be, widely available for anybody. So a group through Pew, Charitable Trust, they did a, a little ninja mission. They flew satellites over the Pacific to see where boats were coming in and out. And sure enough, this is Rapa Nui's exclusive environmental zone. These are all the people going through it. This person turned off their radar, turned off their beacon, because they know they were fishing illegally. So that is the reason why we're getting all of this material here, is because either it's being tossed overboard, it's being lost, so forth. But benefits. Let's not always cry about it, right? Let's do something about it. So the, go the local government there, a group called the Mesa de Mar. Uh, they, and it just got approved, I think, a week ago, but it's been in the works for a while, one of the largest marine reserves in the world. Um, almost 300,000 miles square, that one's miles square, of an area around that any time an illegal fish or boats come in there, Chile has full reign to kick them out. You cannot pass in there. We hope that this measure will stop some of the AMD that's coming. Time will tell. Time will tell. So what we've also tried to do then is we've got to get awareness out there. We've got to show people. They, they, they have to adapt, and the Rapa Nui people can adapt. I've seen some of the coolest creations on that island of people making something out of nothing. So this is one of my best friends, Nico. Um, this is the ex-president uh, of Chile, uh, Michelle Bachelet. We took all the microplastics that we had, and we made a moai out of it. We call it the conscious moai to let people know, do we want stone on this island or do we want plastic on this island? And the local Rapa Nui people are smart too. They're taking microplastic and making things to sell, keychains. Or Hajave, um, another group that does snorkeling and surfing and so forth, they've collected it and give it away as tourist items. But we have to be careful because a lot of these items in here can be contaminated. These things are through the ocean for years. They can absorb chemicals. So you're playing with poisonous materials. So we've also got to be careful about how we do it. But one of the best bets is that we still keep teaching our youth. This was one box that we cleaned off from the beach of Oahe. And we use this in our educational stands, especially Nico with his group called Ka'ada, 
we put all our reports out there and we let the kids separate and see. Be tactile, let them touch, let them realize what's there. And that educational idea really kept me moving. So I knew, okay, I got the environmental activism, that's one thing, then I also wanna do education. So I've been part of three excellent programs um, and one of them is called Terevaca Archaeological Outreach, which is run by this gentleman right here, Brett Shepherdson. And for, this is its 15th year anniversary of teaching Rapa Nui youth archaeology, anthropology, geology, 3D scanning, uh, non-renewable energy. We're putting our bets on these kids, as we all are. That's, all, that's what we're here for. You've all put a bet on these kids. Well, we're doing the same thing there. Um, we have rigorous theory and practice, where we have traditional classroom settings and lectures, and then we take that into the field um, if you're interested, you can just go to terivaca.net. You can see some of our stuff, perhaps make a donation. Um, but this is a, a really heartfelt program. Brett will be there this year. We'll both be there this year. Uh, and I think this year he's going to do a little more 3D scanning. So what we can do with 3D scanning, we can scan artifacts, and then we can give it to the students to measure, to map, without damaging real collections. So they learn that process. Another one that I've had a little more um, connection with and, and, and started was a group called Manuidi, the messenger birds. Um, and these are our little messenger birds. Uh, and we do a similar a technique. We do theory and practice. At one second, right, we have the traditional learning method that we're all doing. But if these four walls could actually talk, we can actually get beyond them and get people into the field. So I take them to my sites where I make them map and draw she thought this was horrible. I thought it was outstanding. You're also giving confidence, building them up, right? Um, this is our first graduating class. Uh, and I had said, let's, let's all do a selfie. And they're like, no, you're too ugly to be in the selfie. <laughs> I said, you're right, but let's do it anyways. So this was our, our, first, our first class uh, that, that went down. If you're interested in speak Spanish, we've got a, a clip up there. You can just type in Manu Edi, Dale Simpson, you'll find it in there. And then the last uh, bit of outreach that I do is working with the museum uh, that I've been working with since 2001, multiple types of presentations, where again, we're using these models of getting them out of the classroom and teaching them in the land, letting them hold artifacts, going to quarries, going to sites, seems to be very uh, successful. And short term, three, four day events, right? Maybe we'll do two weeks and we'll meet uh, two hours uh, every Friday, you know, we, people have busy lives that we all discussed in presentation like, well, these kids, they're busy. They have a million things. Well, these kids too. They live and all they can do is surf all day and fish. <laughs> Why would you want to leave? Um, but th those are some ways. So environmental, uh, activism, outreach, and then finally my research. So I had to count all these things together and I didn't source that much. I didn't want to nerd out, but if you're interested, go to ResearchGate Academy. I'm in there. In total, um, my book's almost there, thesis almost there. Um, these are just publications about Rapa Nui and presentations. This is my 53rd presentation about Easter Island and my 26th presentation for my PhD. Um, I constantly, I'm prolific. You've got to get out there. You have to do the diligence work. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I'm not trying to flash myself, but this is my passion. This is what I want to do the rest of my life. And the way to do it is through research, publication, and presentation. Now, one thing that's always guided me, as I had mentioned, I like political economy. I think it's a good framework to look at the past. I think it's a good framework to look at the present, to be honest with you. Uh, and what we find when we look at people like the Maori in New Zealand, or the Marquesans, or the Hawaiians, or the Tahitians, or the Samoans, is that Rapa Nui's ancient political economy is very similar to all these other chiefdoms. Remember, they're coming from that motif. They're very similar, but it's just like anything else. When you come to a new island, there's new challenges, new resources. People evolve, people change, okay? And what we find out is on Rapa Nui, as I had mentioned, there are these elite individuals that we see in the oral tradition and the ethnographic li literature and the ethnohistoric and the archeological, uh, the Ariki. In Hawaii, the name is uh, Ali'i. Very similar word because they had chiefs too and Rapa Nui became Ariki. The Mao was the paramount chief and the Paka are sort of his retainers. But he also had in each clan a Tanata Honui who was the uh, sort of the big, the big man of that clan that would help. 
And what these individuals try to do were basically control three parts of the past, the political economy, the stomachs, the minds, and the war. Uh, it seems very simplified, but these frameworks give us something to work from, to understand a little better. Again, Ahu Tongariki, beautiful site. Uh, it, 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 this is the first place that I went to when I got to the island in 2001 and just basically collapsed. It was the power of this place. Something happened here. Something was amazing. People came together. There was collaboration. But what I was interested in is what we see is elites oversee resources. They want to pool resources, redistribute them, use them for their own means. Sometimes it's to uh, further control the political economy. Sometimes it's to control the ideology, how people think. And sometimes it's to control military campaigns. They funnel resources from one place and put it into another. So we knew that when you look at the platform from the back, none of the statues are facing the ocean. Don't believe the movie Hop, okay? If you've seen that movie, you have a kid. The majority all face inland. Why? Because they're watching the village. These are the ancestors. They're not worried about Captain Jack Sparrow cruising on the back line there. No, no pirates, no aliens. They want to talk about the ancestors. So here, when you have the eye on the prize, the word mata, as I said, mean clan, but the word mata is also for eye. So mata is watching the mata. Mata kite mata. So I have the ancestors, the great chiefs, or important people that have died. You have houses like Hare Nui's, which are the big house, smaller ones called Hare Paengas. You have the earth ovens, you have the gardens, the manavai, and the chicken houses. Well, I like GIS. When I was in my master's, I was a GIS nerd. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world, and I realized it's just one more toolkit that I could have. And I ran some viewshed analysis, which shows from one point, what resources can be seen? And over and over, almost 80% of the time, anytime I looked at an oven or a garden, it was within the viewscape of the platform. This is what I call a visual scape. These individuals were controlling, not only, not only remembering the elites who are looking at the elites, but the farther that you move away from the platform, that's where the poorer people live. Poor. It's like you go to a beach house, right? Richest people live closest to the beach. Other people live way in the beach in Airbnb somewhere. But here, over and over, we were seeing that these individuals planned it like this. So every morning that I got out of my house, or every morning that I gave, I had a, an oven, or I, I gathered uh, sweet potato or, or banana, ancestors are watching me. Anytime that I wanted to plant, I wanted to make sure I had fertility, the living ancestors blessed it, the old ancestors blessed it. We have a similar situation here. We live under a panoptic. We are, just walking in this room, I must have seen eight or nine cameras. We live in this type of system every day. To me, this is uh, the panoptic of the past, the eyes of the past. These are the eyes of the present, right? And you could have a whole discussion about the political economy of these type of things, but I won't nerd you out. So, graduated, I was uh, overeducated and underappreciated, <laughs> and I was looking for work. And luckily, uh, I got a job at the Field Museum, which was outstanding. Almost 10 years ago today, I started, to be honest. Uh, and I was in charge with the curator there, John Terrell, and the, the, um, the collections manager, Chris Phillip. And I was charged to make a web page called PacificAnthropology.org. And in that, we put on all of our, uh, uh, everything that we've done at the Field Museum, more so John Terrell's work, who's the most prolific Pacific anthropologist that lives, I think, in, in, in Illinois. Well, he lives in Wisconsin, but... Uh, but one thing I, I keened on was the Rapa Nui collection, right? I love Rapa Nui. I've been studying there. Why not find other places in the world that have collections? And one of them was there. And it was an amazing array of stuff because these were brought in by collectors even from the 1800s until the 1950s. So it was a really cool window to see things like the Moko. This is one of the only artifacts that actually is on display at the Field Museum, a lizard man carving that was traded with people that visited uh, this is a mata'a, um, probably used to peel potatoes, some say for warfare. This is a turtle shell belt that you would wear. Uh, an eel, which is great eating. Turtles, moai miru. Oh, this is a cool tattoo needle. You want a tattoo? And I tried to get, I was like, well, where did all these things come from? And sure enough, I learned about this man right here. 
Captain uh, A.W.F. Fuller. Uh, he was a man that collected some 7,000 artifacts from the Pacific, some uh, 180, I believe, or 280 from Rapa Nui, but he never went to the Pacific. He never entered the ocean. He went to auction houses. He bought things from private collectors. He bought other people's collection. And he amassed this thing that he put inside his, him and his wife. You can imagine his wife, but she was a collector too. <laughs> and they just had this, uh, you know, sort of apartment in, in England that was just mobbed. There wasn't a spot on the wall without an artifact. So he wanted to sell this collection, uh, but he didn't trust the British Museum that much where he was living. And he ended up meeting a gentleman called Roland Force, who was at the Field Museum, the then curator. They bought the piece, Roland Force and his daughter, or, and his wife, excuse me, they uh, published a book, very famous. If you want to read a cool book, check that out. But this guy's the connection. His name's Percy Edmonds. And Percy and Fuller were friends. Percy was the manager of, a she of the sheep herding company of the island during that time. So he would send artifacts like this Moai. See this little Moai Miru here? That's that guy right there. And he would trade things for, um, Fuller would send bales of clothes. He would send gramophones. He would send tins of tobacco. And in return, he would get all of these artifacts. So it's a, it was a cool story. All right, moving on. So I'm still interested. And I'm like, you know what? OK, I like to see how other people collect Rapa Nui material. But what about when a Rapa Nui person collects Rapa Nui material? And this is one of my, my greatest informants, to me one of the most intelligent men on in the island, um, Carlos. Uh, this is his book collection, which that's how he started collecting artifacts. He's got more Rapa Nui books than I do. He's got, he's got eight versions of <coughs> Aku Aku by Tor Heyerdahl in eight different languages. Um, but he started to collect and buy. And he has a roughly about 600 pieces on the island in his, well, his father who just passed, in his uh, hotel. And it was just sort of thrown about. So we went in there over the summer, uh, and we completely organized it. We documented it. We photographed it. And what I really learned is crossing that divide. Um, we use terms in anthropology that come from linguistics. We use etic and emic as two terms. The etic is that scientific side using deduction to understand something, top-down methodologies. Emic is more the local, the native perspective. And we both are seeing it differently. He's thinking about that oral tradition. I'm thinking weight, measurement, matrix, cortex, geochem. But when you bring those two things together, you're showing a reality of us. Maybe not the entire reality, but us as an entity. So we wrote uh, a paper about co-curation between a gringo and a Rapa Nui. So finally, the last little bit here. So lucky for me, my family has been teaching at COD for 50 years. My uncle and aunt started the fire sciences here at COD. My father taught heating air conditioning for 13 years. And through a bit of nepotism, I was contracted in 2009. Jared, just letting you highlight that for you. You saw the 67? Yeah, all right. Um, and from there, I've tried to do everything I can for this universe, for this college. Um, I was just presented at STEMCOM about a month ago. Um, they wrote a little article about our entire family. I got a grant to go to Harvard on another Pacific uh, Studies course that I brought that information back. So sometimes your job as teachers, as we're doing here and educators, is to be a, a broker. You, bring, you cross pollinate what you're picking up here and you bring it back to somewhere else. That is diffusion. That's one of the best things that we've done as humanity, as human beings. Um, I also took that information and started an online class. That's, I have one person, how many people in class here? Two, yay! You guys are outstanding. Full marks, thank you. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's really about this, this, this package about being on the field, feet on the ground, feet in academia, feet with where, where your passion lies. These are all very important things. So. I was happy working here. I got a, I got a one full time. I had a full time year. Uh, I was pulled off full time back to adjunct, and I said, "Nah, I'm going to go study my PhD." Why did I go study my PhD? I don't. No, I love it. I'm piled higher and deeper, but I love what I do. And it started with me being interested in stone tools and political economy, and I really got interested. And in then with these navigators, these Polynesian navigators. How, how were they being traced to see this movement? How were they able to make that movie Moana to see this movement of people? And 
uh, one of the most important tools for Polynesians are these adzes. Adzes are four-sided compared to an ax that's two-sided. Well, if you were digging out a tree to make a double-hull canoe and you had an ax, you cut right through. But if you have a level plane that an adze has and you come onto, it's easier to chunk out your, ad, your, your canoe. So, um, and what we found is that there were certain areas that rock was better than others, right? Geological paradise, there's different type of stone. And what we found is that these individuals are moving stone through ever. They're picking up, they're making their boats, they're bringing core materials with them, and they travel around. These were amazing navigators. And they, we, we can trace them because uh, individuals like my advisor, my Sh Marshall Weiser right here uh, at UQ, he's revolutionized how we can trace then the geochemistry um, of these stone tools from source to end product, okay? We've even uh, identified, because when you work with some of these uh, techniques, you have to drill into the artifact. So trying to convince a Rapa Nui people you want to drill inside of an artifact can be a little difficult. So we try to be less invasive as possible, but all we need really is five milligrams. That's smaller than your fingernail. So it, 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 it is a viable means. We've got other techniques now that um, we, we're not being as, as abusive as you see, but this gives us the best science. Uh, and he's, he's used these ads as he's recreated some of the movement, uh, and it's a great story. So simply, just really quick, just so we know what geochemistry is, it, it, it's exactly as it sounds, the chemistry of rocks. So this is an island, this is Easter Island, all the little undulations that you see are the volcanoes. Well, one of these volcanoes in particular right here called Manga Orito makes obsidian, dragon glass if you watch Game of Thrones. Um, and from there, each one of these quarries have their own uh, elemental uh, properties. Um, we look at major elements, trace elements, oxides. These are going to be our fingers, okay? From the fingers, I got to trace where these quarries are being used to make tools like adzes or the mata'a, right? These become my fingerprints. So really, I'm just a detective. I'm an archaeological detective. And my job is to see how it goes from source, how it goes to the finalized place, and then does it go, you know, sometimes I, I know all the sources now, but every once in a while you have an artifact that you don't know the source. But I know that this perpetrator exists. I got to figure out where he came from. My dad was a police officer. You'll get it. Um, but at the end, this movement helps us talk about access, control, exchange, and use. We use different type of techniques. Uh, one is called PXRF, portable x-ray fluorescence. It was what I was using in that video. Compared to inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, sometimes it's laser ablaze, sometimes it's oscillating. It's all nerdy stuff. But the point is, we can get at these elements. The, the PXRF is nice because it's portable. I can bring in the field with me. That's, that's always nice. I don't have to be, be as destructive. I can get 31 elements, which works perfect with obsidian. It's a volcanic glass. But basalt is much more fine grain. So what we have to do then is use a, a non-portable machine. That means I got to bring samples back, right? Uh, it's minimally destructive. I get about 57 uh, elements, which are more for my comparison and statistical analysis. And I can also get at oxides, which help. Those are, those are unique identifiers. Got to do your diligence work. You got to go through the record. You got to make sure. So when I did the literature review, I noticed all of the studies that have been done since 1974 until 2016, what they were analyzing, what's the sample size, what's the control, what methodology. And right away I found out not that much work has been done in basalt. What's going on there? Why isn't that being done considering how many features that we've seen, how many stone tools that we've seen? Why isn't anyone analyzing basalt? So that was going to be my PhD. I said, yes, let's talk about interaction and let's talk about talk about political economies using the movement of basalt tools, and that became my, thesis, my research question. What does the movement of Rapa Nui's basalt artifacts, as traced geochemically from geological sources to archaeological location, tell us about patterns of pre-contact social interaction and the island's proposed collapse? That was the heart of the research. But to be able to do this work, I had to get permits. I had to um, sit for four months why they waited and deliberated to see if they were going to give me this work. It was a heartbreak. I didn't have any nails. I must have lost 30 pounds because this was my whole life on the line that they could say no. And what I found out is there were so many people I had to talk to, the museum, the Natural uh, Heritage Council, 
the, the, the secretary of the, the, the Heritage Council, the Development Council, the Indigenous Council, the Park Council, the Parliament, the Tourism, the, cam the, the, the Tourism Chamber, the Aeronautic, because we flew drones, the public. Now I've got to deal with two new groups that have come on an island through its political changes that I didn't have to worry about when I got my original permits. So you're dealing with complex political discussions, social discussions. But in end, I got my permits, and it was great. But I learned a few things in this process of talking with my, my folks. What was the term you used uh, about listening? Potency. Potency of listening. I thought that was an outstanding point in the gentleman's chat. And I had to be very trans. I had, I had to not say eight words when four will do, but listen to 800 words. And what I really found out is that being transparent really helped me. But at first, they would yell, caojo, caojo gringo. Get off my land. And you're like, Whew. that's pretty serious. Okay? How do we do this? How do we deal with this? Well, you gotta ask those who, what, why, where, when, how questions, right? You gotta, you gotta figure out what they want. And what I my lesson there was I had to be very ostensible and adaptable as possible. I had to listen to and understand critiques masked as support. And I had to follow state and local entities. While this is a problem, and I show you this because Chile and the Rapa Nui state, it's a political mess at times. This was, this was a toma, that it's called, where the Rapa Nui people tried to take um, over land, and the, the Chileno uh, Carabineros and the Gope, which is like their um, SWAT or whatever, uh, they end up shooting rubber pellets at people and landing. These are people on their own land being attacked by the colonial government. What do they see me? Another gringo. So I, I, I'm, I'm sort of linked in here, but I'm a little bit different, because I'm doing the environmental activism, I'm doing the outreach. Um, I also felt like I was in an archaeological PR mission. I'd make sure that I got on the radio. I got on TV. I gave presentations to community. I still do that. I give back because that's the best way to keep the transparency, to let them see your integrity. And that's a very important part. Uh, I also walked, biked, drove from house to house, campsite to campsite, and fire pit to fire pit to plead my case as to why another gringo should be able to conduct more field research, remove sacred and valuable material culture off the island to the other side of the Pacific, and use destructive methodologies to geochemically analyze archaeological and geological material. It's not that easy. What I end up finding out is the backlash. There was a huge backlash from other, from other archaeologists who didn't do the diligence work, who didn't give back to the community, who took so much information, artifacts and samples, and they give little back. This was multiple informants telling me the same thing. So there it is. There's that listening thing. OK, something's wrong. Um, I also found out that they didn't like how short people stayed on the island. Researchers get there for two weeks. They, they come in, then they take off. And then they don't come back for another year. So. It's about putting your feet on the ground, being there for a while, putting the time in. Um, three points that they really highlight. One, for local assemblies and per that, that, that they were worried about, is that local assemblies, you need time to go through the permit process. And these gringos wanted to fast. We're used to this system. I sent in the, the email. It's there. I'm ready to go. OK, next day. It took me four months to get permits. And I stayed there the entire time. We did all this work. Um, they were upset that local people couldn't, per couldn't participate in the archaeology. Because they'd come in, they'd leave. They wouldn't know when it happened to be gone, that's it. Um, and lastly, no one was putting educational outreach and information in the local school curriculum. They're they know everything about Chile, but they know little about their own island. I'm sure we've heard that story in our own country. So in the end, um, I think something else, this is um, Singa and Neka and Seva and Tuti and Nico again. These individuals were great informants, uh, and they yelled at other gringos who can't speak the language. Language capital is just as important as social as human capital. If you read a little bit of Pierre Bourdieu, you'll realize why linguistic capital is the way forward. Um, and my favorite quote of this was, these gringos come from aboard, they, abroad, they do their research, they go back to their universities, but when we and our children want to know about their work regarding our island culture, we have to buy a book. Right? That's not a very healthy relationship between the researchers and the local folks. So all of these came in my mind. Um, I know I'm running a little late on time. Please forgive me. Um, 
but this is what we decided. We got five study areas in our group uh, that we worked in that I had done because I had four months to <laughs> screw around. I was able to walk and look and take photos. So I started right away, got some things done. Um, and this is that important part about doing empirical research to avoid plagiarism, to avoid uh, academic dishonesty. Get your own work, find your own empirical data. So going in the field for years, uh, you know, we would have our spreadsheet and we'd make sure we got our own data. Things like the name, locations, GPS, is it an open or closed site? What are the measurements? What is the description? Has it been photographed? Has it been mapped? Has it been grown? Has it been sampled? And this was sort of my Bible for about two years. I don't want to read it anymore. <laughs> um, I would tell a story about a dog's here, but I'm running a little short on time, so I'll pass. I'll just add a little Jimmy story another time. <laughs> so one of the sites that we worked at, Via Tide, which you'll just see this little map to orientate yourself, uh, we found 13 sites that were pretty important. This is from a drone picture above it. And right away, we can see some of these quarries we're after. Uh, you can see where these are, these are flake scars, where they're taking out. Uh, here's a two meter bar, by the way. It's pretty large. It's, it, you know, this is like about 200 feet of the size of this quarry. It's enormous. But this was a different material quarry. They were using this to make some of their houses and slab stones. We found out they weren't really using this for artifacts. Um, but on the south coast, where uh, Emundo Pont, uh, Coro, a master, taught me so much about um, you know, the process of making stone tools. Go to the source. There was an article written saying, where have all the Coro gone? Which means they're dying. Get the information while we can now. So he took me in the field and showed me how he makes his fish hooks. I felt like someone was giving me 800-year-old knowledge. It was really impactful for my life. And I, every time I go there, I bring him a gift. Um, but inside there, I found that they were making mines. They were actually digging into the earth. So this is the run. You can see all these little mine structures. They found one sp specific piece of basalt that they are after. And instead of going from the top in, they went into the earth. And they mined this area from here. There's another two meter stick just to get the idea six foot. That's a room you could live in. This is all debitage, which is the process of making stone tools, the after product. Uh, and there's also material that you can use, uh, like poro stones, which are beach rounded stones that you can use. You have material pigment called kiea to paint yourself. So in short, this was a very important place. Had another site in a, in a quebrada, in a little broken area, um, but this was the mother load. I found an area called, we, we named it Putoki Toki, after an individual who died, who called it that. And we found 42 sites in one area. One of them, and again, you're, I, I, I'm just spitballing this, but this is a huge area. There's the other two meter stick right there. These little things right here are called puku. This is an outcrop. This is what they're after, very fine grained basalt. Most likely this puku extended all the way to here, but they excavated all of this. In this site alone, we've hypothesized they probably pulled out 10,000 stone tools out of one site out of 42. But this is the largest on the island. So there's my fingers. I know where all the fingers are at. I end up pulling 290 samples. We analyzed 117. We thought that was a good sample size. Um, we basically, when we calculated how much area was used in these, in these five areas, was about 11,000, almost 12,000 meters squared of basalt area which basically equals two football fields. So when we think about the statue and how big it is to transport carve, this is two football fields. One quarry could be as much as the entire DuPage end zone. Um, so now I got my fingers. I got to figure out where the fingerprint is. This is my son. Oh, your summer vacation is it? Oh, good, you're coming to work. <laughs> uh, so he came, to the, he came to the island, and we were able to go inside the museum's collection. Uh, these are all the archaeologists that have put something in that collection. Uh, and I had to write letters of support to make sure, is it okay? Is the integrity there? Do you trust me to use your artifacts and not be, so, and not be in the paper? There's a big disjunct between using someone's data and including them on the paper. You know, it is very expensive to do archaeological work. There's money, time, there's a lot of investment here. So I had to keep my friends close, my enemies closer, 
and write everyone and say, can I have access? Can I access? I wrote 11 letters. I got 11 yeses. So my integrity was intact. I knew I was doing the right thing. Um, I also worked with Joanne Van Tilburg, and that's why I had to ditch out of the conference a little early yesterday because we finally got another article being published at the end of this month, and that's through the Easter Island Statue Project and the Rapa Nui Geochemical Project. This is her excavation of a moai inside the quarry where they, where they are carved. This is a 15-meter excavation. Inside there, we found some, or they did, this excavation I was not a part of, they found close to 2,000 stone tools next to one statue. So because we have a temporal control with all the individual levels and we know where the stone tools are coming from, now I can talk about time. But we also got carbon-14 dating, which really much helps us see that time a little better. So now I have my fingers. Got the fingerprints. Got the, sorry, got my fingers, got my fingerprints now. Red boxes being the sources. I got my artifacts, and I sampled the entire island. I try to find places all throughout, inside the upper class clans, inside the lower class clans, inside different clans, just to have a better sampling strategy. Um, but as you know, I got the permits. I had to take them to uh, Brisbane and then to Chicago, where they were actually analyzed. So I had to just cruise. Rapa Nui, Tahiti, New Zealand, Brisbane, Chicago to analyze, back to Santiago and to Rapa Nui. I had that thing at about 49.9 pounds. <laughs> and then the other 80 pounds, I really appreciate Land Chile and Air Tahiti Nui for granting me to take these for free. Um, but what was crazy is when I got in New Zealand, because they're Maori, they wanted to see every artifact. I was in customs for half a day. They said, I want to see these beauties. And they opened every single one up. They didn't have to do that. I'm not doing anything wrong. So we did some 3D scanning in, in, in uh, Tahiti and on Rapa Nui. And now we're making these that we're going to give to little kids in toy packages so they can play. Why do they play with a horse from Chile when they can play for an artifact from their own island? Um, this is what my table looked like, trying to organize between geology and archaeology, finger, uh, fingers and fingerprints. We took uh, high-res photos as well so we can get good details through Martina Magason. Uh, if you are need a headshot or anything, she's really great, but she does a good job with artifacts too. Uh, and then we analyze at the field. Yeah, that's my dad. That's Big D. He was a cop, uh, but then he worked at Fermilab as a cryogenic engineer for 10 years. You know, when I worked with him, the only thing that I learned was how to hold a flashlight and get yelled at. So <laughs> when, when he started to work for me, it was the best opportunity to get back at him. So I got him on the PXRF. He helped with some of the sampling. We were taking our notes. We went from this sample to these samples. Smaller, get it smaller. We put everything online, share our data. Data sharing is important. Anyone that does PXRF, here's their data. They can compare what we have. We put a photo, put a map so they know where we're coming from. Um, you got to collaborate. You have to work with other people. So I really thank Lore and the Field Museum because as my boss says, I'm an archaeologist, not a geochemist. I've got to work with other people. You've got to collaborate. You've got to fill the gaps. So I really appreciate Lore. This is what really a geochemist does, <laughs> looking at Excel all day. <laughs> That's a funny joke. But anyways, so <laughs> gathering, gathering your empirical data, this is what it looks like. This is archaeology, folks, really. If you want to be an archaeologist, no stats. Figure out stats as soon as you can, because we have to look at things and count and so forth. Um, this is what after the stats, after our data comes in and we quantify it, this is what it comes into on a biplot. We ran principal component analysis. And what we found out, all the circles are the fingers. And all the little sites are the fingerprints. And right away, we saw some things. A lot of them were coming from Putoki Toki. Some were coming from the southwest coast. None were coming from Ranokau. So that was a good thing to realize. We, we realized, but we also saw, what about this stuff? What about these guys? Well, these are quarries I haven't found yet. So the research continues. Research never ends. You only answer a question to get four more questions. Um, so what, the, what it comes down to the visualization is here's all the movement. The majority, almost 90% of all of Rapa Nui's basalt tools came from one place. They were being moved from these two quarries all throughout. We did see that the southwest coast, we do see some uh, sites that had it. And most likely, this is more of a kinship or regional network. This one is probably a larger 
uh, uh, chiefdom network. Um, and it's interesting. I got two more slides. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. So what's interesting is that when you look at these stone tools, they're found from one place but distributed everywhere. Same thing with the statues. They're from one quarry. They're found everywhere. The Pukau, from one place, found everywhere. The, the, the obsidian, one's place, found everywhere. This is communal use. So although those chiefs are controlling certain stuff, they're letting other stuff go. So I'll just start with this one. I'll end with this. So what, I'm, what I found out in, in short is that these elite, although they have control, they're very much controlling living species. They're using their mana, they're using their energy to control how things grow, make sure the fish come in. But the stone, it's not living. It doesn't have mana. Stone could be used by any way, by anybody. Therefore, it's communal. So this is it. So protection for the future. So this is um, just a Facebook thread. This is a lawyer on the island who's married to a Rapa Nui man who's on the uh, Koraipa conference or co uh, council. And I just wrote, hey, oi, you're awesome. Thank you so much. This is great. Thank you for everything. Uh, thank you so much, Pokey is his name. Uh, you've helped me so much. I'll never forget you. A lot of mana and love to you guys. And he writes back, for your expedition, we've put Putoki Toki inside the park. That means it'll be protected forever. I'd like to dedicate this presentation to um, Hotumatua Pate and Josie, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Sorry about that, a little late there. I, I started five minutes late, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, cool. <laughs> Questions? What happened to the rats? Oh. <laughs> okay, so rats were introduced by the Polynesians, the Kioe, because they ate them. Uh, the meat's good for fishing, the bones. Um, the rats come into the island and they found filet mignons in the nuts. So the idea is by the Polynesians bringing inside rats. The rats start eating the nuts. The trees don't regenerate. We lose the trees. So the idea of human impact to Polynesian islands is a very true thing. Are the rats still there? They are, but now they're the European rat. The Polynesian rat, Ratus Excellence, is a small little guy. The European rat is this guy. And he, they, took over the one species. And now they're the dominant ones. And they're tough. I don't screw around with Rapa Nui rats. They're in the room. I leave the room. I'm like, yeah, you're good. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> They're big boys. <laughs> no, cool, of course. I, right on. Right on, I guess. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you for not falling asleep. I really appreciate that. I know we have some other activities. Yeah, and we have, we have some. Don't get up yet. Oh, gosh. We have some closing uh, conference items. First of all, I want to thank Dale. This is wow. for you. Wow, thank you. And thanks for everything thank you. that you've done. We appreciate it. Where's... Thank you.